Pac-12 is back. We'll dive into the latest news and what it means for both them and the Mountain West. Plus, the Cross is making its move to grow its U.S. presence, and we get a live report from the Solheim Cup. It's Friday, September 13th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we have some major conference realignment news as four Mountain West schools are joining the Pac-12. Our reporter Amanda Kristovich explains what that's going to mean for both conferences. Our editor-in-chief Dan Roberts sits down with Premier Lacrosse League CEO Paul Rabel. And my colleague David Rumsey reports live from one of the major events on the women's golf calendar, the Solheim Cup. Plus, all is not well with the White Sox and A's. First, let's hit some headlines. Aja Wilson set the WNBA's single-season scoring record Tuesday night. Wilson entered the game only 11 points away from the record and broke it with a pull-up jumper late in the first half. With four games to go left in the season, Wilson has a strong chance to be the first WNBA player to reach 1,000 points in a single season. Her current total sits at 956. Tyree Kill called for Miami-Dade police officer Danny Torres to be fired after his detainment on the way to Hard Rock Stadium Sunday morning. In a statement from Hill's lawyer, they said, We are of the opinion that the officer's use of force was excessive, escalating, and reckless. We are demanding that the officer be terminated effective immediately. The Miami-Dade Police Department has placed Torres on leave, which his lawyers called premature and demanded immediate reinstatement. The woman making a new accusation against Deshaun Watson is looking to meet with the NFL within two weeks. Her lawyer, Tony Busby, said that we have a video and two additional witnesses for the NFL to speak with. I've personally never had confidence in the NFL's disciplinary process, but my client has chosen to engage it. Watson has denied the allegations, which his accuser claims took place in October 2020. Manchester United reported a loss of over $148 million, despite having a record revenue of $866 million for the same financial year. In fact, United have recorded losses of over $118 million in three of the last four years. The team laid off over 250 employees in July in an attempt to cut costs. United is not the only Manchester team in financial trouble. Manchester City's hearing for 115 violations of the Premier League's financial fair play rules begins on Monday. The hearing could have serious implications on European soccer, with City facing a forced relegation or even expulsion from the Premier League if found guilty of the most serious charges. Manchester City have won the last four Premier League titles in a row, cementing themselves as one of the most dominant soccer teams in the world. But those achievements could be overshadowed if found guilty for one of the biggest financial scandals in sports history. The Pac-12 has gained a second wind with Boise State, Colorado State, Fresno State, and San Diego State all agreeing to join the conference ahead of the 2026 season. NCAA bylaws give conferences a grace period of two years to reach a minimum of eight teams. With the addition of those four schools, the Pac-12 is only two schools away from surviving conference realignment. We'll have more on this with our reporter and college athletics expert, Amanda Kristovich, up next. Joining me now is Front Office Sports reporter Amanda Kristovich. Welcome, Amanda. Hey, how's it going? Good morning. Good. Good. Yes, it's definitely my morning. Uh, yours too, I guess. Um, so you confirmed shortly before the announcement came out that Boise State, Colorado State, San Diego State, and Fresno State are all leaving the Mountain West for the Pac-12, um, just as someone who's been following the fall and perhaps rise of the Pac-12. Um, how do you react to this news? Yeah, the resurrection. Um, you know, they're, um, the last time we spoke about the Pac-12 on the podcast, I think I ended by saying something along the lines of, you know, they had um, decided not to renew their scheduling partnership with the Mountain West. And I said, well, I mean, clearly they have something up their sleeve. And I guess it was this. Um, so this is not a cheap move. Um, the PAC 12, um, is going to have to pay the Mountain West $43 million as part of the aforementioned scheduling partnership to get their, you know, to get these four schools from the Mountain West and the Mountain West schools each are going to have to pay $17 million in exit fees. Um, so the Mountain West is, is definitely getting, you know, a nice eight figure cushion, um, for losing these four members. But yeah, I mean, look, the PAC 12 is going to get these schools in 2026. Um, and they're going to be on the hunt for two more because in order to maintain FBS status, they need to have at least eight schools. Um, you know, but I think it's safe to say that the PAC is back. 
And as our uh, newsletter newsletter reporter David Rumsey uh, coined this morning, the six pack, which I will be using until the end of time. Or until they get two more members. Right. I mean, you can use it for a little bit, but it sounds like, I mean, going two to eight, it's like, yeah, maybe, but it sounds like they'll have to, you know, merge with the Mountain West or something. But going six to eight seems very doable. Mm -hmm. um, especially, and now, obviously, they're very motivated. They, they are committed to this move. Yeah, they've paid $43 million to get two thirds of the way there to, from where they were. Um, and so it seems kind of inevitable that they'll get two schools from somewhere though a any early feeling about where those two schools might be coming from more mountain west schools yeah well i could tell you where they're not coming from <laughs> they're probably not coming from the acc um at least as of now so i was there was obviously you know speculation this morning about whether or not stanford and cal would turn around and go back to the pac-12 because it makes sense from a, you know, geographic standpoint, right? Um, however, um, I was able to confirm, and this isn't like huge breaking news, you would assume this is logical, but I was able to confirm that Stanford and Cal are parties to the ACC's grant of rights contract, which means um, that they're parties to the same contract that Florida State and Clemson, who are currently in court trying to invalidate those contracts, um, you know, they're on the, that same plane. So essentially, one of two things needs to happen for those schools to get back to the Pac-12. Either Florida State or Clemson needs to win in court or, you know, Stanford and Cal themselves would need to go to court. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to not necessarily put the kibosh on that rumor, but I just wanted to, like, point out how difficult it would be to get those two schools back. Um, you know, but of course there are several others that are in contention schools on the West coast, mountain time zone, central time zone. Um, the makeup of the PAC 12 is changing, right? It's a lot of, you know, big state schools with, um, really like sort of regional sports and football programs. Um, so, you know, we've got to think a little bit about the new PAC 12 versus what the old footprint was in looking at, you know, it's like, I'm not even sure Stanford and Cal would fit from a flavor perspective, right, um, at this point. So we'll have to see. What does this mean for the Mountain West? I mean, are they in a potential death spiral here at this point? Or, what, yeah, what, what's what's the deal? I don't think so. I mean, they have so much uh, money coming their way. I mean, what's 17 times 4 plus 43 million? <laughs> um, you know, and they've got some time to, you know, find some new members of their own. They've got some time to um you know talk about and re-up what their media contract is going to be uh going forward also important to note that while they're losing you know quality members and quality brands you know if if i remember correctly boise state was getting like extra money um i think so you know i i, I don't the mountain west is not in a death spiral by any means um, you know, and then just like personally, Commissioner Gloria Navarez, this is not her first rodeo. She obviously anticipated something like this happening, which is why she got that huge exit fee into the scheduling agreement. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's not the greatest day in the history of the Mountain West, but I, I don't think it's any cause for for major panic from from their perspective. And is there, other than the Pac-12, you know, looking for those next two schools, is there any other, like, big domino here that you're expecting to fall sometime soon? Expecting, no. But the other big domino I'm going to be looking at, in addition to who the Mountain West is going to try to bring in, um, is, again, we've been following Florida State and Clemson for a while. Um, if those contracts are invalidated by a court, then the entire conference could be the next Pac-12, Right. Um, because invalidated media rights uh, contracts and grant of rights agreements or ones that expire before you sign a new one. That's what causes a conference to fall apart. Uh, so that's what I'll be looking at in the next six months. Very interesting stuff. We live in interesting times. Amanda Kristovich, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Chicago White Sox owner Jerry Reinsdorf briefly discussed the team's historically bad season with the media on Wednesday, saying, This year has been very painful for all, especially our fans. We did not arrive here overnight, and solutions won't happen overnight either. 
The Southsiders are on pace for the worst season in the modern era, which in baseball parlance starts in 1901. This isn't necessarily a case of owner negligence. The White Sox payroll is in the middle of the pack this year and is typically in that range. And Reinsdorf is right that there is no quick way to turn this around. But the big question for him is what this means for the team's huge ask for public money. The team's lease at guaranteed rate field runs through 2029. Reinsdorf wants a brand new stadium, and he wants around $1 billion in public money to make that happen. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker has been skeptical about coughing up anything close to that, and the team has been bad enough that Reinsdorf now has to make a public show of caring that they are this bad, and that's not to say he doesn't care, but if he sends the wrong vibe here, the team's losses might extend from the field to the state government. But if Sox fans need some schadenfreude to feel better about all of this, they can always look west to Oakland slash Sacramento slash Las Vegas. The team could provide an update on their Vegas stadium at the Stadium Authority board meeting on October 17th. For now, we have no clarity on who might be willing to lend hundreds of millions of dollars or purchase equity in the team. The A's are counting on both happening at some point. But now their interim home in Sacramento is also being called into question. The MLBPA has not signed off on the move, and MLB's most powerful agent, Scott Boris, told Sacramento-based KFBK Radio that he opposes the move because it will mean playing on artificial turf outdoors, something no other MLB team does, in scorching hot weather. Boris thinks Sacramento could be a good location for an MLB team, but feels the A's playing there could actually set the city back if things don't go well. Of course, the A's will be moving into an existing AAA park used by the Giants affiliate. However, that does not actually provide a proof of concept on the playing surface issue because the field is grass right now and is being converted into turf to more easily accommodate two teams. All this has made some wonder if the Oakland Coliseum, which is now owned fully by the African American Sports and Entertainment Group, could come back into play. MLB did its best to shut down that notion, saying in a statement to Front Office Sports that it is a certainty that the A's will play their 2025 season in Sacramento as planned. MLB is continuing to work productively with the MLBPA on the details of the transition. The best bet here is that the team will in fact go to Sacramento and then Vegas, but no part of this process has gone smoothly for the team. And this one ain't over till it's over. Al Michaels thinks he has the best slate of games yet on Thursday Night Football this year, and he credits the growing importance of streaming to the league's future for the shift. Quote, last year was considerably better, and this year is even better than that, by far the best of all, and I think a lot of it has to do with where the business is right now. Streaming is more and more important. My colleague Mike McCarthy often notes that the NFL is holding broadcast TV together, but at the same time, it's building its replacement. The league is a major driver of subscriptions to Prime Video and Peacock, and as of this year, perhaps Netflix as well. Sticking with the NFL, there may be trouble brewing with the Arizona Cardinals. Sunday was the NFL debut of Marvin Harrison Jr., one of the most anticipated receiver prospects in a long time. However, Harrison Jr. was targeted only three times by quarterback Kyler Murray. He had one reception for four yards. These things happen, and there's no real reason to lower expectations for Harrison based on one game, but Murray had an odd choice of words when talking about it after the game, saying, quote, Sometimes the ball goes to him, but it's not my job, obviously. He went on to say that the plans are in the hands of offensive coordinator Drew Petzing, and he expressed confidence in his new receiver. Fairly or not, Murray seems to draw this spotlight for strange reasons periodically. At the outset of his career, he took an awkwardly long time to choose between football and baseball after getting drafted into both sports. The Cardinals initially put a clause in his contract requiring four hours a week of independent study of the team's playbook, which they removed after it became public. Anonymous sources questioned his work ethic in the wake of his five-year, $230 million deal with the Cardinals. Even though it's not his job to target Harrison specifically, the Cardinals are staking a lot of their future on the Murray to Harrison connection. We'll learn a lot from Sunday's game against the Rams. The Premier Lacrosse League has its championship on Sunday. Ahead of the match, front office sports editor-in-chief Dan Roberts spoke to the league's CEO, Paul Rabel, on starting a new league, the importance of media to its survival and growth, and ESPN's use of AI to produce game summaries. That conversation is next. Okay, Dan Roberts here in the FOS studio in New York, and I've got Paul Rabel from the PLL here today. Paul, thanks for coming in. It's so good to see you, man. You were so one of my first you. interviews when we launched the PLL in 2018. Wow. So you, you guys have come a long way with the Premier Lacrosse League. I mean, when we talked at that time, or maybe it was even the second interview we did, but you were talking up, hey, now we're on NBC Digital, and we're yeah. on you know, NBC Sports Gold, or whatever yeah. that streaming platform was. Now we're with ESPN. Yeah. I mean, we are seeing the evolution in terms of distribution and media. And as we know, for an upstart sports league, it's all about media deal and distribution. Yeah, you could argue for tier one sports leagues, it's about media rights. Yeah. It still remains the number one revenue stream for the NFL and the NBA and 
Major League Baseball is going to sort theirs out with the RSNs. Have to urgently. Yeah. Well, what I would say about our time announcing the league in 2018 was still early related to private equity and you know the, the amount of sophisticated capital that we see coming into pro sports, specifically sort of like tier two, tier three emerging leagues and the value proposition. If you look at the NBA over the 20 year period of 2002 to 2021, on average, the teams increased by 1000%. And so that outpaced any MLB, any NHL team and the S&P 500, which by the way, over a 20 year period, the S&P is up eightfold. You know, if, if, especially if you're investing on an annual basis. Well, so, I, I always say that there's no such thing as a guaranteed investment, or you shouldn't say there is, but buying a piece of a major pro sports franchise, pretty close to guaranteed in the last couple of decades. This whole space has changed. I mean, I like to say that we're living through a transition period where you still need, I mean, you mentioned the RSNs. Like, if you live in a certain city and you have to see your NHL or MLB team, you need to get the local RSN. So there's people who still need cable, but every year there's more and more and more big NFL games and other league games streaming, yeah. exclusive to streamers. I mean, let's talk in 10 years, it, it'll, it will have continued. But when you look around the landscape, I mean, you know, great to be a partner of ESPN, but you probably also feel like, who knows, sky's the limit in terms of distribution. You mentioned Peacock. Amazon is in this game. YouTube, Google yeah. owned is in this game. Netflix has NFL games. So everyone is kind of crowding yeah. into the room for all kinds of live sports rights. Well, sports are the last standing firewall for appointment watching television, which is the biggest unlock going back to ad dollars, right? So you, so ad, ad, the ad business is so favorable to sports because of the appointment watching component, which was eradicated out of entertainment when, when DVR happened first, then streaming. So if an advertiser can count on eyeballs and specific eyeballs on the platform, then they're going to likely serve a portion of their budget, which, by the way, globally, at the end of 2025, the advertising uh, industry is going to be $1 trillion. And as we talk about churn of broadcast cable subscribers in the U.S. down to 60, it's still a $60 billion advertising business. So ads are so, so important. Um, I don't want to talk too much about ESPN during this interview, but one more question because we just had some news today, which is that ESPN will use uh, this generative AI, I think it's um, Microsoft Azure powered, to do game summaries. And they're starting out with game summaries and recaps of two leagues, PLL and NWSL. So I don't know, do they have to approach you for something like that? Is yeah. that something you're actually involved with? And you know, from the journalism side of things and the media side of things, is this, oh God, here comes the AI writing, or, or this makes more sense and is not quite an example of that. Talk, talk to us about how. On the AI front, here's what I'll say. I studied the strike uh, in the film business a year ago. Um, I believe that AI augments effectiveness of your people. We don't use, and I know ESPN is not introducing AI to replace the workforce. They're looking to multiply um, output. And when it comes to emerging leagues like the PLL and the NWSL, where they have already resourced us for the first time this year with personnel to cover games, remember, we play four games a weekend. And so to be able to get content and more content out, not just game recaps as they cited, but also highlights and um, closed captioning, I view it as augmenting effectiveness mm -hmm. and not replacing. And I think it's so critical to get that right. And it was an example of you know, the difference between Jimmy's interview and a tweet. Mm -hmm. Jimmy's interview, everyone gets it because you get long form chance like you and I have to discuss it. The tweet, you don't really. Harder and, to get through nowadays. And yeah. it gets ratioed, right. which leads to this conversation. Right. But I believe that much like Google search did in uh, the 90s and early 2000s, it enhances our ability to get better output faster. Mm -hmm. uh, how important is it to have big backers, and I don't necessarily mean financially, but kind of big fans? And I'll ask about one in particular who is dear to both of our hearts, and that is Bill Belichick, has yeah. always been a big supporter, right? Yeah. Uh, we have certainly written recently about Belichick at FOS because he is entering his TV era. Yeah. But he's been a, a big kind of flag waver for you guys. Yeah, well, I think it's critical to have both. Long-term capital, that some would say are irrationally passionate about a respective discipline. Um, and there's a history of that. Phil Antritz in the MLS, there's the Fertitta brothers in the UFC. We have someone like Joe Tai, 
who is, I would call, and I was with him this past weekend, the godfather of lacrosse. He played lacrosse growing up in the U.S. He played at Yale. He watches the Yale Bulldogs and some PLL games uh, from Air Joe when he's yep. handling his Alibaba work and all the other stuff he's going on with the Brooklyn Nets. and Nets, Liberty, Seals. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's an unbelievable person, really strategic, very long on lacrosse, and we wouldn't be here without him. We have a group like Rain Ventures and Colin Neville, who also played lacrosse in college, who believed in our pursuit and wrote our first term sheet. I mentioned Arctos, we have the Churning Group. So when you have Peter Churn and Mike Kearns and Jesse Jacobs, who are historically supremely talented when it comes to media and tech businesses and personality-driven businesses, which I'll segue to, um, you've got yourself a really nice board. Um, that's critical. On the Bill Belichick front or personalities, sport intersects with culture. Mm. I think of Constance Schwartz, who's done such a good job with Smack and like developing, you know, whether it's entertainers like Snoop Dogg coming into sports or athletes like Michael Strahan going into entertainment. Uh, there's not a lot of people that understand how to shoehorn that because it is different audiences almost entirely. And I think basketball has gotten it right. Uh, European football gets it right. Uh, I still think American football is behind those two. Um, but talk about Taylor Swift and the impact that she's had on the anomaly that we call the NFL. She can even drive more hype to that massive engine. Um, so when you have a Bill Belichick, when you have a Method Man, when you have a Kevin Durant that are all in several ways a part of the PL, either as owners or uh, just fans of the sport, um, you know, guys like Steve Carell and John Bernthal and Justin Timberlake and Jamie Foxx and Justin Bieber, they all play the cross. And so part of my job is thinking about how do we get right. them back into the game that they once played? And I understand why they're not, because the pro game was fairly non-existent for the last 35, 40 years. Um, if you turn those engine lights on, people start noticing more. And when you have a sport like lacrosse, which similar to hockey, maybe in the 90s and early 2000s, has like certain stereotypes. There's like fighting for interest amongst fan bases to have someone who is a sort of iconic across sports and multiple disciplines vouch for you is pretty big. And that's why we launched our street lacrosse with, with Kevin Durant. So it tackled two things, a, a new and accessible way to play lacrosse, which is him and I grew up in the DMV and always played hoops because you always had a, a neighborhood court uh, and you just play pickup but a sport like lacrosse and football, you can't because they require 10 players per side, a goal, a goalie, and a bunch of pads. So let's just get sticks and tennis balls and play pickup lacrosse on a court. Um, and you know now we're gonna have a huge turnout from a celebrity and athlete standpoint at our street lacrosse event ahead of championship weekend in Philadelphia this September. Yeah, there's some Ice Cube Big Three style wisdom in that, I think. Yeah. Um, let's end on this. Six years or so since the league started, Look into your crystal ball in the next five to 10 years. Uh, you know, championship weekend has become a, yeah. a bigger story. Where will you guys be and, and how do you feel about where you are right now? Yeah, well, we eventized our championship weekend. So taking, call it NBA All-Star Week, uh, the NFL Super Bowl, um, and what eventizes, we have our end of year awards on Friday, September 13th. We have street lacrosse in Philadelphia and our founder's dinner, which is effectively our commissioner's dinner on Saturday the 14th and then our game live on ABC at three o'clock on the 15th in Philadelphia at Subaru Park. So to be able to create sort of wraparound entertainment where you can bring in your partners, investors and other celebrities or influential folks that can uh, get a taste of the product for the first time is new for us this year and we're really excited about it. Um, we talked about the innovative model being tour based um, and our first stage when we first met was that we didn't tie teams to cities, and we had six of them. Cut to this past season, which was our first year, where we are now eight teams from six. We put our teams in cities, and we kept our touring model by touring to those home cities. We saw an uptick in merchandise, in social media audience following, in ticket revenue, um, in local tune-in metrics as a result of like, now all of a sudden I'm a big sports fan in Utah and I have the Archers, when they're on I'm watching, and when they're in town I'm going and I'm wearing my Utah stuff and I'm buying more stuff. So that's phase two. Phase three 
is a decision that we'll make as we look forward into the Olympics and lacrosse getting back there in 2028. It's like, how do we continue to build this business model such that we either decide to go long and we're sort of a team sport taking an F1 model because it's going to work and it becomes profitable and all this other stuff. Or we decide to go, okay, now we're ready to sell teams. And if we sell teams, we're finding individual owners and markets that own venues that fit the right prototype from a cash and liquidity standpoint to a, you know, prior existence or experience of running sports teams. And then we go from eight to measuring potentially 10 or 12 all on the right supply demand curves based on audience growth. Um, and we make a decision from there. But I sort of view the goalpost as Don Garber would often and notoriously be known for trading MLS against global soccer growth and things like getting the Olympics back to the US and the World Cup back to the yep. US. We have this amazing moment, having worked hard to get lacrosse back in the Olympics in 2028, the first time since 1908 it was competing as a medal sport on the heels of an amazing Paris Olympic Games. Yep. It probably brought us back to the feeling that we had in the 90s watching the Olympics with yes. our family. It's gonna be bigger in LA. So we're sprinting to aggregate a bunch of attention and momentum as we head through those goalposts. Yeah, huge chance for you guys. Nice. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. The Solheim Cup is underway and my colleague David Rumsey is on the scene there. We talked about what this event means for women's golf, the vibe at the event, and what he's hearing from leaders in the sport. I'm joined now by front office sports newsletter writer live from the Solheim Cup media room, David Rumsey. Welcome, David. Hey, Owen. Thanks for having me. Hey, great to have you on, especially on site. So just real quick for our listeners who may not know, what is the Solheim Cup? Basically, if you're familiar with the Ryder Cup at all in men's golf, that is when the best 12 players from the United States compete against the best 12 players from European countries. And that is pretty much exactly the format here at the Solheim Cup. You have the best 12 uh, female golfers from the U.S. against the best 12 golfers from European countries. Um, this event started back in 1990 and is played every other year, typically uh, once in U.S. And then it goes to a European country. So once every four years in the U.S., once every four years in Europe. But there's been a little bit of a snafu because of some COVID delays with the Ryder Cup, and they like to be in separate years. So the Solheim Cup was actually played a year ago in Europe and is now being played just 12 months later here in the U.S., just outside Washington, D.C., and now they're getting back on schedule. And just what's the, the vibe there? You know, it sounds like we're, well, you know, we're obviously fully post-COVID, but um, yeah, just what's, what's the feeling at the tournament right now? Yeah, everybody is really excited. There's supposed to be record attendance here, well over uh, 100,000 fans, uh, if not more. There's a lot of corporate support uh, being just outside Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. Um, sponsors are up. Uh, I, I think viewership should be up from last uh, time when the tournament was in the U.S. Uh, NBC is NBC Sports is putting more of the coverage on their network channel, NBC. So uh, signs are positive. Um, the chatter for the competition side of things is the U.S. has not won the Solon Cup since 2017, so they're hoping to get that back. Last year in Europe, there was a tie, 14-14, uh, but because Europe had won the previous tournament, they retained the Cup. So that's that's kind of the drama um, on site, you know, huge build outs. There's a 2,000 seat mini stadium right around the first tee. So I think those uh, opening shots should be pretty electric each morning, you know, when it's uh, 7 a.m. and fans might have had, had a couple beers already so that, that'll be fun to see the rise of women's sports has been maybe the biggest meta topic that we've had you know in our time at front office sports um how much has that reached the golf world yeah i think i think it's getting there i don't think it's uh to the level of uh basketball certainly college basketball uh WNBA, those you know huge viewership spikes that we see and certainly attendance around caitlin clark um even the NWSL seems to have, you know, those huge media deals they just signed and record attendance uh, again this year. So uh, I will say, though, in women's golf, there is a lot uh, more corporate support than there used to be. Uh, it seems like more people are showing out to tournaments and, and prize money is going up uh, for these women that are competing out here on the LPGA Tour uh, week to week and then as well as at major championships. So. I think it still has some work to do to get on that same level, maybe in the U.S., as we've seen with you know basketball, soccer, 
uh, throw volleyball in there too uh, on the college level. But uh, it, it's not like it's lagging so far behind that it's egregious or anything. Sort of along those lines, um, you, you said the Solheim Cup is essentially the Women's Ryder Cup. Um, is there any actual, you know, discussion, collaboration between the two cups? Not really organizationally uh, or operationally. They, they certainly support each other. You know, the U.S. players like to support each other and, you know, send good luck. Uh, same thing on the Europe side. Um, but, yeah, it was interesting because, you know, last year the events, the Solheim Cup and Ryder Cup were played back-to-back -back weeks in Europe. Uh, Solheim in Spain, the Ryder Cup in Italy. But it was just kind of, you know, two separate events happening. There wasn't a, a lot of synergy uh, when they... Team USA captain Stacey Lewis was having her press conference here earlier this week. You know, I asked her, hey, what were the pros and cons of playing a couple Solheim Cup and Ryder Cups uh, in the same years? Because it happened in 2021 as well after the, the Ryder Cup was delayed to that year. And she said, you know, she doesn't have a preference on whether they should be played in the same year or not. But she thinks that when they were, there was a missed opportunity to do a little bit more. Um, and, and then she had a really fun idea. She said that the President's Cup, uh, which is operated by the PGA Tour and pits uh, the top men from the U.S. versus international countries outside of Europe, which that's going to be later this month. She said, hey, that should be a mixed event and you should have men and women from the U.S. competing against men and women from uh, other countries outside of Europe. Um, and there's a lot of really good uh, female golfers from Asian countries, Australian countries, uh, things like that. So I, I think that would be really fun. Uh, I don't know what the logistics of getting that done would be, but uh, that, that was a cool idea, I thought. Any questions that you're looking to see answered by the tournament itself? No, I think I'm just ready for uh, some competition. It's going to be fun to watch. Uh, you know, it's, it's so different when the players are here. They're not competing for prize money this week. I was just talking about, you know, there's record prize money at all the majors this year that it's going up on the LPGA tour. But this week it's, it's not about prize money, even though there is a lot of money coming in as far as ticket sales, uh, sponsors, et cetera. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just about pride and country. Uh, so I think that, you know, it gives golf that team setting that, you know, it's, it's so hard to kind of just root for one player throughout the year. But, you know, when you can, as an American, you can say I'm rooting for team USA or as, as someone from Europe, you can say I'm rooting for, you know, but Team Europe, I just think that makes it uh, very cool, certainly during Ryder Cup years. And I think uh, people can definitely get behind the Solheim Cup, too, even if they don't watch a ton of women's golf throughout the year. All right. Well, enjoy it. David Rumsey, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Owen. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. The Carolina Hurricanes' home has a new name. The Hurricanes have agreed to a decade-long naming rights deal that will change their home from PNC Arena to the Lenovo Center. Before long, it will be different on the inside as well. Last year, the team committed to staying in the area for at least 20 years in exchange for public money to support a $300 million renovation. Team owner Tom Dundon has $800 million in development surrounding the area planned over that span. Included in the plans are 100,000 square feet of retail and food space, 150,000 square feet of office space, 200 apartments, 20 of which will be designated as affordable housing, a 150-room hotel, and a music venue. PGA and Live Golf are breaking barriers later this year, squaring off in a head-to-head -head match for the first time ever. It comes at an interesting time as talks to merge the two leagues have seemed to stall out over the past few months, although PGA Commissioner Jay Monahan said recently that the discussions have been stronger lately. Although the two sides have often been pitted against each other, some of the players believe that the upcoming inter-tour match represents an important step in the potential merger. PGA's third-ranked golfer Rory McIlroy has been a PGA loyalist but said last month that anyone that cares about golf I think has to be frustrated over the lack of progress on a deal. But he seems excited about the upcoming exhibition, which is not officially sanctioned by either tour. On Wednesday, McElroy said that he wasn't trying to send any sort of message by agreeing to the match and that his participation is based on the belief that, quote, this is what could happen or these are the possibilities going forward. I've been saying this for a long time. I think golf and golf fans get to see us together more than four times a year. Bryson DeChambeau, who will be facing off against Rory on the live side, called the event an opportunity to get this game back in good standing. While the PGA and PIF still can't get on the same page, the players are ready for everyone to be friends again. Caitlin Clark liked Taylor Swift's photo endorsing Kamala Harris. When asked if her like was an endorsement for Harris, this is what the WNBA star had to say. I think for myself is, you know, I have this amazing platform, so I think the biggest thing would be just encourage people to register to vote. Um, I think for myself, it's the second time I can vote in an election. At age 22, I could vote when I was 18. So 
Um, I think do that. That's the biggest thing I can do with the platform that I have, and that's the same thing Taylor did. Um, and I think continue to educate yourself um, with the candidates that we have, the policies that they're supporting. Um, I think that's the biggest thing you can do, and that's what I would recommend to every single person that has that opportunity in our country. Meanwhile, Patrick Mahomes is also encouraging voter registration and is also keeping it fairly neutral. The Chiefs QB said, I don't want my place and my platform to be used to endorse a candidate. I think my place is to inform people to get registered to vote. Americans have a tough time uniting on much, but getting to the polls on election day is something almost everyone seems to agree on. That's it for today. We'd love it if you shared this show with a friend. And if you have a take on the day's big topics, send an email to today at frontofficesports.com and your thoughts could be featured on the show. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you on Monday.